Hello and welcome to the third episode of the series on Enter ID. So this time we will focus on defense. That was always my primary goal, but in the previous episodes I wanted to show you how the attacks can look like, what are the uh, paths, what are the uh, techniques to better understand why we do some configuration, why we do some things for defense. So we went through the like the motivation of the attackers, mostly it's monetization, but even so they need to know how they are going to make money on the attack. If they are going to blackmail someone, if they are going to uh, sell the credentials, sell the data and so on. And then we were speaking how they can get into the environment, how they can move in the environment, how they can like stay hidden in the, in the environment for a longer time. And right now we are in defense position and we are looking how we can defend our entity. So like with the other stuff, where to, where to start or where to look for the information and the knowledge. So we can observe the actual threat landscape. We can learn from the actual attacks and we can think about the future attack techniques or future paths. And as well, we can learn from the research of others because Enter ID is a technology used around the world and the other companies or organizations, they already prepared some baselines. So we take these two paths or these two parts and combine them together. So the main ingredients of the defense are hardening. We need to like modify the configuration of our Entra ID tenants to make them more silent, more secure. But no matter what kind of configurations we will do, always there can be some attack or something which will pass through our like first line of defense. So we have to have some monitoring technologies. So we are able to detect something is going on in our environment. And then we have to back up our data in case they are broken or encrypted or still stolen. And with these all three parts, because they are similar like on on-prem environment, we have to be thinking that we don't have to, or we cannot overcomplicate the stuff. We should keep it simple as much as possible because complexity is the enemy of security by my point of view and as well we should we should uh, set ourselves the goals like step by step we shouldn't be thinking like we are here and now we want to jump to like super secure environment no we should do it like over in, in increments like small increments which we are able to handle because many times we don't know if the configuration which we are going to like uh, implement is not going to break something or if it's not going to make us some uh, wrinkles. So that's better to do step by step than to implement like 30 changes. And then when something's broken, we don't know what which change just produced the problem. Okay. And then it's important to know like, in what context I'm speaking, okay? Because we are Czech, uh, Czech uh, company from Czech Republic and the companies, they are usually smaller here. So the things I'm speaking about, I'm more focusing on companies with up to 1000 seats. It can be like 2000 seats, it's not a problem, but the difference is like those companies, they have small internal IT department or maybe they don't have any internal IT, that, that's still fine, but it's not a company with 100 or 200 of internal IT stuff, which is highly separated into the different roles like storage administrators, network administrators, firewall admins, uh, desktop support, L1, L2, L3. So no, not this case. We are thinking, uh, we are speaking about the companies, 1000 employees, small internal IT department. Okay. So let's start with the hardening. So the most important thing is about privacy accounts. There are two, two rules. Okay. First rule, like 
the privileged account should be native to the environment. So, for example, admins on on-prem active directory should be local user accounts. They shouldn't be synchronized to cloud. And the same for the cloud. Like if there is some global admin or some privileged user, it should be cloud native user. It shouldn't be a account which came from the on-prem environment. It is very important because if we keep them separated, then it will be harder for the attackers to move between the on-prem environment and the cloud environment. So that's the, that's uh, in the lateral movement phase, I've shown you like that's this path. And it is important because if some environment will be compromised, you will have more chances to defend the other environment. So if on-prem will be compromised, you have chances that you will defend the cloud environment. But if we will use like synchronized users to manage on-prem and cloud environment, it will be much harder. And then it's the same principle, same rule like on on-prem mis environment. We have to separate regular user from high privilege accounts. So for example, even as IT admins, we should be working as regular users on our computers. And for administrative uh, tasks, we should have separate account or maybe a little bit more account than just one. So that's the same with entire ID. We, we can have one user like for regular work and then different users for administrative privileges. Microsoft has uh, some PIM functionality, which is just enough administrator, just in time administrator, but uh, these are more like P2 uh, functionality, which is not so common in Czech Republic. So for normal companies, it is easier to have like several accounts because the administrative account don't need to be licensed. It can be a user without any license. And last rule is that we have to be very careful about servers running Azure AD Connect. I don't know if it's going to be renamed and it will be called Entry ID Connect. That's the software which is synchronizing uh, the local accounts to the cloud. And this, the server who is running the software is very privileged. It's privileged as domain controllers. It's a tier zero. And that's because if someone is going to compromise that server, he will be able to control what environments, cloud and on-premise environment as well. So these servers has to be hardened and protected as much as, as much as possible. Then there is some observation like from the field, I can see that many companies who are implementing uh, cloud, they don't have any like rules for the mobile phones and the users are using several applications for the same functionality. For example, someone uses iOS mail, native application, someone uses Android mail, someone uses Microsoft Outlook, someone uses Samsung mail or other applications. And the problem is that it's harder to support these scenarios. And Microsoft Outlook is, I believe, the only mail application which will have most functionality or full functionality with Office 365. And that's the same like with Microsoft Indicator. I think Microsoft is going to push heavily Microsoft Indicator because it's more secure to have Microsoft Authenticator with, with push notifications than to have just uh, a software uh, or other Authenticator for MFA, where you are using the time-based one-time password. And it's because, for example, that time-based OTPs, you can clone it multiple times. So, for example, when user is set up in his MFA and he's scanning the QR code, he can, if he saves the QR code, then he can set up it like for on three, four, five, six phones. No one knows. Or uh, if the attackers will find out the QR code, they are able to clone their MFA. And that's the same like if the phone will be breached 
and the secret is not protect like secret which is used to generate these time based uh, passwords will not be protected well the attackers they can clone it or steal it and they will have MFA for the user as well it's not so easy or it's almost impossible to do it with the Microsoft Authenticator and push uh, push notifications because I believe Microsoft Authenticator is protected uh, well and the QR code which is used to set up the Microsoft Authenticator is just singly use QR code. And with Microsoft Authenticator and push notifications you can have information about where is the signing uh, prompt going from, like the, you will have map, you will have IP, so you have more information and as well the Microsoft Authenticator sends some telemetry to Office 365. So it provides better or higher security. And if you will use Microsoft Authenticator everywhere in your company, it will be easier for you, like for an admin to support it. And as well, Microsoft Authenticator is the, so uh, Microsoft Authenticator provides passwordless authentication method as well. It's the only one. And with Microsoft Outlook, it's the same. There is some functionality which you cannot find in the other mail clients. So for example, external, tags, pull view, mobile application management, and uh, Azure information protection, and so on, or for example, shared mailboxes. So I would recommend to use these kind of native apps and to keep your environment simple as possible. Yeah, I know that some people, they have experienced that uh, it's easier for them to use the native mail application because they can synchronize the calendar and they, they want to use the native calendar in their phone, not the one who, which comes with Outlook. I'm aware of it. Yeah. Maybe like the like some compromise or some solution between could be to have Microsoft Outlook for mail in the phone and as well the account added to the phone but to keep uh, synchronization of calendar and contacts only not to use the native application for mail. So we would have, you will have the account uh, configured twice in the phone, but you will be able to use like Outlook for the mails. And that will be the first step before the users will get uh, comfortable with Outlook. And then maybe we can remove the account from the phone directly and just leave it in the Microsoft Outlook. Okay, so with the configuration, so there are some easy configurations which we can implement. They are very similar to those which we have on on-premise Active Directory. So for example, by default, every user can join his device to enter ID. If we will come back on on-premise environment, you know, since 2008, Windows are 2008, every user had permission to join computer to Active Directory as well with a limit of 10 devices. But like recently in last two, three years, it is recommended not to disable this permission, not to enable users to join computers to Active Directory because direct, it's not a security problem directly, but it allows the attackers to gain new computer accounts, which can be misused in other attacks. So in the way of hardening, it's easier, it's better to limit who can join computer to Active Directory. So why should be enter ID different? So I propose to disable users the possibility to join devices to enter ID. Because if you are an admin of a hybrid environment, you will bring the devices to the on-prem Active Directory. And if you are cloud only, you will probably use some bulk ways how to join the computers to enter ID. Or you will have some privileged group who can access, or who can join computers to enter ID. And if the user is set up for the first time, you can give him the possibility. And once the device is joined, you will remove him the permission. And then that's the same like with the application registrations and application consent. I Microsoft just came with an idea to empower the users, to give them possibility to do most of the stuff. From my point of view and my experience, it's like the users, they don't understand the technologies enough to, to know what's, what's good and, or what's bad or how to use the technologies. 
So it's easier, like if everything goes through the IT department. But, but as I have told you, it's about the context, about the experience. Maybe you have different experience and you will change different, or you will choose different configuration. But from my point of view and from the experience of auditing all and try the tenants and to see the mess which is there after two, three years of using, it's like, no, the users cannot, shouldn't do it themselves because they don't understand the consequences of their actions. And it's the same with the group creation. Uh, the possibility to access entire the uh, admin portal and the same with uh, inviting guests and guest visibility. And then there is other configuration which is like someone can use it, someone don't, for example, for me, like because sometimes we do some business email compromise investigation and this kind of business email compromise scams, they are more like it's hard to uh, to fight with them on the technical side. It's easier to educate the users responsible for money or for bank accounts. But what as IT we can do is like to enable exchange external tag. So it means like uh, the Outlook or mobile Outlook will show external flag in case the email comes from like third party. Then, for example, in our company, we do password reset like once or twice per month. So it's easier for us to do it this way and to disable the possibility on all the tenants because self surf password reset portal can be a way how to get in or it can be a persistence like I show, like I demonstrated in the last episodes. Then it's about authentication methods and unified authentication which I'm going to demonstrate to you right now in this uh, demo. So we are going to configure the stuff I've mentioned a few minutes earlier. So first we are going to user settings and we will disable users to register applications. We will restrict them from creating other tenants. That's, that's I don't think why, I don't even understand why they should have this uh, kind of privilege and the, we will block them to from creating security groups. As well, we will restrict what the guests can see when they are in our tenant. We will restrict their access to admin portal. Now we will block them to do LinkedIn connections and we will disable the way or this possibility for them to have persistent web browser sessions because it's not necessary and I will demonstrated or I will explain it a little bit more during the conditional access part. So then we can limit who can invite guests. And with the groups, we will block users for, from creating Microsoft 365 groups. And as well, we will block users from joining devices to enter ID. We will give the privilege just to some users which are in some group. It feels to me to use security groups to delegate the permissions like a good way to go. It's the same like what we are doing on Active Directory on on-prem environment. And even if we would select like none, that no user can do that. Still, there are methods like bulk methods which can be used to join devices to enter ID. And we can restrict users from recommending BitLocker keys. Yeah, that's like, it's not, it depends. Like, I don't see a reason why the user should be able to find the BitLocker keys because users which we know, they don't even know what are the BitLocker recovery keys and they are not able or they don't know how to use them or why should they use them. Okay, but for us, for IT, when we use them, we use them once the laptop or desktop gets screwed or something and after the update or something, it's not booting and unlocking BitLocker automatically, we have to provide recovery key. And yeah, sometimes it happens, but in that case, Admin can always 
go to enter ID, find the BitLocker recovery keys and provide it to user. We don't need that user can access the BitLocker keys, BitLocker recovery keys all the time because BitLocker recovery keys can be misused. I know it's not so probable, but with knowledge of BitLocker recovery keys, you can root your device. You can boot your device to other environment and alter the, your device to have administrator privileges on your device if you don't have them normally. So that it allows the users to do privilege escalation. I know that the users, they won't do it normally and the attackers, they will probably not have the access to BitLocker recovery keys and as well to the device, like physical access. But yeah, the, the question shouldn't be like, why I should deny it or why I should block it. The question should be more like why I should allow it. And I don't see any reason why to allow users to see the BitLocker recovery keys. And then we will modify the possibility to do the consent. I would, I would like, I think the user should be able to do consent of any application and we, but we can allow them to request, uh, or to ask for a consent. And then we can have a privilege, uh, uh, we can have a security group, which will be the one who can review the user requests for the application consents. And then we can go through the authentication methods. You know, there's a little bit of uh, chaos right now because these application methods are going to be a single pane of view on the authentication and self serve password reset and uh, MFA methods like portal. Right now it's on separate like views, but Microsoft is going to consolidate it here. Okay, so this tenant this demo tenant is not brand new. I, I think I've already did some other uh, configuration changes. So let's go through it and let's try to, for example, do some changes. Uh, I cannot give you like the good baseline because it depends on the, uh, on the company, how they want to do it. But for example, look on the SMS. We can read in the text in the app that SMS is usable for multi-factor authentication and self-service password reset portal. It can also be configured to be used as a first factor. Okay, what does it mean? It means that if something is first factor, it can be used to sign in. So it means like you can sign in to your account with username and SMS. You don't need the password. And to disable this functionality, we just need to like uncheck this mark used for sign in. In that case, SMS will be like a valid factor for MFA. So you have to, you, you need to use username, password, and then you will use SMS to provide yourself or you to log in with MFA, or it can be used to recover your password in case you forget it with the self-serve password or reset portal. And then what we can do is we can block the third party software uh, OAuth tokens. That's the thing I was speaking about. So in that case, MFA will be able to, you will be able to do MFA with the time-based codes or push notification just through the uh, Microsoft Authenticator. And then we can disable the certificate-based application, which I enabled during the uh, attack demonstrations or during the phase of persistence and the custom uh, CA. And then we can disable the self-service password reset portal because for us, it's not necessary. We can uh, reset the password for our customers by hand because it's not a burden for us. And as well, like uh, to reset the password, you just, by default, you just need one factor. So for example, just an SMS or an email or MFA prompt to reset your password and to that someone is able to log in to your set your custom password. And what's not so common knowledge is that uh, there are like two settings for password reset portal. One 
post password reset portal is for users and the other is for administrators. I don't see any reason why administrators should be able to do password recovery. Okay, if you are a single admin in your environment, then it's important. But if you there is multiple admins, or you have some partner who has a global administrator role, then you don't need it because these guys they can reset their reset password on for the other one. So if some if one gets lost or one lost his password, the other admin can recover his access. And you definitely don't want that any attacker is able to reset the admin password just with one factor. Okay, and then we have that unified audit log, which we need to turn on. It's easy, it's free, and it's a one one time action. So it will take some time, but now it will be enabled. And for the other stuff, we have to go to PowerShell and do it through PowerShell because they don't have possible or they don't have any GUI and interface. So first is to connect to Exchange Online and to enable the external flags or external tags. And then we will connect to Microsoft Graph. And disable the password reset portal for admins. And that's it. So if you will refer to configuration, we have to wait a little bit of time because it takes some time to like update the settings. But right now we can see that the portal is disabled. So that was a demonstration how we can change the configuration to be a little bit more secure than the default configuration. Okay, another big part of enter ID security is conditional access. The conditional access can, or they are saying, under which conditions someone can access some resource. No. So what we can do is that we can block the access, we can grant the access, but require require more restrictions or requirements like MFA, some authentication strength, that the uh, user is coming from a compliant device, a bridge joint device, or that he applies mobile ap application protection policy, or he needs to change his passport. And as well, we can limit how long will um, his session be valid. So the conditional access is a great tool. It's actually one of the best things of Android because we did we didn't have this thing on an on-prem environment. But okay, it's not the easiest solution as well. We, we need to know some rules. So uh, conditional access is a premium one functionality. So if someone don't have P1 and try the P1, he's not able to use conditional access and he will be sticked with security defaults, which are fine, but they are not granular and they are managed by uh, Microsoft and they mostly require MFA for some type of logins, but I don't know when it's like up to the Microsoft to say when they will require MFA with conditional access, you are able to say, when the MFA will be required or something else. It is necessary to know that they are default level. So if you don't have any CAs, then everybody can like, there are no restrictions for the science. You just need to have valid identity. Uh, then not everything can be set as a requirement, which is a pity because for example, if we would have a scenario like, yes, you can access one application, but you can access it just from a limited set of com company computers, you are not able to do it with one conditional access because you are not able to have like requirement. My requirement is that you are accessing from a device from which is uh, in this user group. Like you are not, you can say that you need 
any uh, company environment, but you cannot say like a specific company, uh, sorry, not environment, uh, device, but you cannot say that you want diff some specific company device. You can do it like with filtering, uh, then blocking the access if you don't have that device. And then to have this conditionalized policy, policy which will add some more restriction. So you will probably do it with two conditional access policies. Okay. So good is that it's possible to do it, but problem is that it creates more and more uh, conditional access policies. I don't know if there is any limit for the conditional access policies number, but what I can say to you that you want to limit the number of your CA policies. Maybe we should have more like 15 or 18 conditional access policies. The reason is that more conditional access policies you have, more complex the things are, and it's harder to audit the conditional access policies. But that there will be a mess that no one will know when it's applied, when it's not. Okay, Microsoft has some like uh, reports for that, but still, like it's like auditing firewall with hundreds of rules like it's really hard to clean it up okay then uh, the difference between the conditional access policies and firewall is that during the firewall you just go rule by rule by priority and when you will find first matching rule you will be like the traffic will be accepted or denied but with conditional access all rules or, or, or conditional access policies are matched. And then if there is some policy which says block, you are blocked. And otherwise, all the policies which matched, they have some requirements like the MFA, authentication strength, or signing uh, frequency policy. And those are like combined together and all of the requirements are required for the current session or for the current sign-in. And then uh, one of the new uh, functions of the conditional access policies, policies is authentication strength. And you can require, for example, that the user is not signed with MFA, but that he needs to be uh, signed with passwordless MFA, or he needs to use FIDO key to be, to be able to access that uh, policy or to be, to be able to access uh, some application. In few minutes, I will have a demo of that and I will explain it more. And then we have a demo of sign-in logs, debugging, and you will see more. So that was the like rules of conditional access. But how can be the baseline? How can the baseline look like? So from my point of view, there are some rules which are, I would say, like global. So we should block legacy authentication. Legacy authentication is authentication which doesn't support MFAs. I would block it at all. And then uh, we should limit uh, how and when the users can register other security information. So how they can register MFA. So there are two like two occasions. One when you need to register your MFA. It's a first time registration, so you don't have need you don't have any MFA. So in that case, we should require something like trusted network, so that we are sure that the attackers they are not registering MFA for the user once they compromise him. And then we should register, uh, require MFA in case that, okay, you have MFA and you want to add other mobile phone or other key, then we should require MFA for that. By default, Microsoft requires MFA in case once MFA is uh, required, but this is just to be sure that in if Microsoft changes his mind, that we have some constructs in in place, which will require the MFA. And then we should limit uh, that to register or join device, you require MFA. Again, it was supposed to be required. There are multiple multiple places right now in Android where to configure it, but let's prepare that the conditional access will be like the final solution. So let's place it there. And then we should have like separate privilege or separate rules for privilege users and users. For privilege users, I would say like they never need to have persistent session and as well like we should implement sign-in frequency so that when they sign in, the sign-in will be valid just for four hours and then they will have 
have to sign in again or maybe it can be two hours or eight hours it depends on you but it's just limiting that in case someone steals their token or uh, session cookie or prt it will be invalidated soon and as well i believe that the administrators should be like linked, leading the way for users so they could use FIDO two keys or maybe we can limit uh, like private sessions just on the trusted network or to have compliant device. That's a recommendation. It depends on how the company and the IT administrators they are working. If they are working from home mostly or from custom devices and so on. And then for the users, I see that sometimes Microsoft recommends like in conditional access, uh, Work for an MFA in case there is some risk for the user, or some risk on the signing. But from my point of view, hey, let's let's require MFA all the time from users. Every time when the user is logging in, just require MFA. Or require that he's on a hybrid joint device or he's on compliant device. And then you we don't need MFA, but still he will probably have MFA because he will be using Windows all for business. But nevertheless, like MFA every time and what is hybrid joint device or compliant device it's another factor actually it's like you have username password what's the first factor and then you are logging from company's device so it's a second factor so in this case it's mfa you know so i would have this kind of configuration and then we can limit it just to mfa all the time and combine it windows hello for business because once you do windows hello for business it's considered to be MFA, so it's easier. And then the user shouldn't be able to have persistent sessions as well. So you will be like, yeah, but the users, they will start working and they will be, uh, they will have to sign in all the time to the browser. No, that's not how persistent session works. Uh, once user is working on company's computer or registered uh, device, he has PRT token. And when he opens Edge browser or Chrome with and then he is signing automatically, so he don't need to sign in. But when he's working on a private computer or someone else's computer, he and he opens the browser, he has to sign in. And in that case, he's asked, like, do you want to stay signing? Yes or no? He, if he says no, then the session, if, and he finishes work, but he forgets to sign out, closes the browser, the session will be deleted. But if he said, yes, I want to stay sign in and he don't sign out and closes the browser and opens the browser again, he will be signed in all the time. And I think that's an, not a desired behavior on private computers. Okay. Private computer can be registered to enter ID and then there will be PRT token and it will be working fine because he don't need to sign in to the browser. But if he's going to sign in on a family's computer, someone else's computer, you don't want that the user stay signed in on that computer. Actually, you don't want that he's able to log in at all, but that would be too restrictive. So at least disable the persistent session. And that was just the essential. And what can we do then with the conditional access policies? We can do tiering. Like the first question for the company is like, do you mind users working on their private devices with a, uh, uh, with uh, with uh, company's data? Yes or no? If they are fine with that, then fine. Or they can say like, yeah, look. We just want them to be able to use Outlook, but not uh, SharePoint, OneDrive or some internal applications. Yeah, and in that case, we can do that. We can do that with a tiering model because we can say, look, for, from every device, you can log into Outlook. But if you want to log in somewhere else, you need to be on enterprise device. And for maybe we can have some application which is very privileged. In our case, it's for example, remote desktop manager like a password manager. And in our company, I don't want, I want that if you are looking into this sensitive application that you are on a subset of enterprise devices because this subset of enterprise devices is with stricter configuration. 
there is more restrictions in place and more monitoring technologies in place. So it's easier, it's better. It's the same like admins are using for managing the network they are using or they can be using different workstation than the workstation which they use for day-to-day -day work or they are using jump server. So you will be you will enable the login just from the jump server. And what's the difference between the private and uh, enterprise device? It's the thing that with private device, we don't know what's the shape or state of the private device. We don't have any restrictions in place, nor the monitoring uh, software. But with enterprise devices, we know that they are in a healthy condition and as well that we have some monitoring system like antivirus or EDR, which is monitoring the device. So if there will be some incident, it's much likely that we will find it out on enterprise device than on a public device. Because even if we require that the public device is up to date, has firewall and has antivirus, the antivirus is not connected to the central console of the enterprise. So maybe the antivirus see some problems, but as an IT admin, you don't know about it. So I have a demo how to configure the conditional access policies, the ones I will, I've been speaking about in the essential part. So because it's nothing new or I'm not, think, I'm not like making it up, Microsoft is already coming with the mm, template for most of the configuration. Only thing is that we put there some prefix. I was using a prefix of AAD, but then Microsoft just changed the name of Azure Active Directory to Enter ID, and I have to like rename all the policies. And once like the policy is in place, Microsoft usually put the actual user into the mm, exclusions. So we just remove the exclusion because I know that these policies are not going to cause us any trouble. But if it's your first time you are doing that, just be cautious, please, and not like not cut yourself from the access. So this access policy is the one who says how and when the users can uh, set up the MFA. There has been exception as well for the guests. Okay, I, I would say that this is a like old recommendation because if, if you have the experience to be a guest in some other tenant, it means, and they required MFA, it meant like you had MFA for your home tenant, but when you were changing to other tenant as a guest, you had to register a other MFA. And if you were guest to 12 or 15 tenants, you had like 15 MFAs, which is a burden. But what's a newer way to do it is that tenant can be set that it can trust the MFA claims for the guest user. So if you, the guest user sign is, signs in into his home tenant, uses MFA, and he is then switching as a guest to other tenant, he won't need to provide another MFA because the target tenant will trust the MFA claim from the home tenant. As you can see, there are other options. There is an option for trust compliant, de compliant device and trust Microsoft Enter hybrid joint devices. Okay. This is thing I wouldn't like enable by default because compliant device is like, it means something different for each party. For example, your party can require that compliant device is very strict setting. But for someone else, the compliant device is every device with Windows 11. I don't know. So, but still the claim in the token is just one. It's compliant or it's not compliant. Not like it's compliant very much. So I shouldn't use it on the default trust. But what you can do is that if you have a partner and the partner is trusted and you know how, what his stance in security, you can say, okay, by default, just trust MFA, but for this tenant, we can trust the compliant device claim and as well, uh, enter a hybrid uh, joint device claim as well. So right now, the guest will be required, will 
be required. Oh, they will need MFA to register other information, sign in information. But I believe, like the guests, they cannot do it neither. So it doesn't matter. And then uh, we will create a uh, conditional policy to restrict how can you what's what's required to join or register device. As you can see, Microsoft only allows us to require MFA or some authentication string. So there is not so many options. And then we continue with uh, requiring MFA for the admins. Uh, because the template requires MFA and we want it to have like session control for that as well. So we will modify the policy and put in the session or the signing frequency as well. And then we will use the conditional access policy for users to that MFA is required or you need to have hybrid device or combined device. The difference between MFA and hybrid or combined device is like, for example, MFA, every user has his specific MFA. But with uh, enterprise device or hybrid joint device or combined device, it's like that one the users can share it. So I want to, I want to say like MFA is even stricter, you know, because MFA means you are using your MFA. But if you are using or you, if an attacker gets access to company's device, so I mean compliant device or hybrid joint device, he will be able to logs in on all the users if he knows their single factor. So if he knows their password, he will be able to log in without the MFA requirement. So it's a little bit less secure than MFA because in case of MFA, you just, you need to have the MFA of that specific user. Okay, and now let's create a conditional access policy which will block the persistent session or disable persistent web session. I told you it's a security stuff and I think that it shouldn't uh, affect any user. And if it affects any users, there is like, you should have yourself a discussion about the conditional access and the security of enter ID, how you want to have it. And then we add some named locations because these na named locations are the trusted networks, if you say it like that. So usually you provide there the uh, company's IP addresses, but on the other case, you know, if you will say you don't require MFA from the company's network, there can be a weakness that in case the guest Wi-Fi in your company uses the same public network so terrifically the attacker would get single factors who he, he would have like username and password but not the MFA could come to your premises or drive the car near to the premises how he is able to like catch the Wi-Fi signal he will be able to sign in as an user without the MFA so it's just like to think about it or to mind it. Okay, and that's like the basic configuration for the conditional access. So if we have hardened our tenant, 
the next step is to monitor our tenant. And there's many things we can monitor, but if we should monitor something like quick wins, it should be like risk users. Because uh, like Microsoft is monitoring the behavior of users and how they are signing. And it uh, asks an, an attribute to the user, which is a risk level. Uh, in the recommendation of Microsoft, there is like written what he is like, how he assigns it or what he is monitoring. Uh, this risky users and risky signings is a feature of P2 and ID Premium 2. But I believe it's working even for free, but you are not able to action on it. So you are not able to use it in conditional access policies, but definitely it works in P1. Not actionable, but still you can go to reports and to see if there is any risk, risky user in your environment. The only difference between P1 and P2 is that in case you don't have P2, you don't see the reason of risk detection. You will always see the additional risk detected. Or maybe leak differentials on maximum internal threat intelligences. All of them are non-premium, but if it detects something from premium, it will be reported as additional risk detected. So it's good that you will have some signs, but the drawback is that it will be hard to decode why. And then I have to mention like that there are two detection types offline and real time. Real time means like that the risk is assigned immediately. And in case of the offline detection type, it means like user receives the risk or no, user does some risky action or risky signing, but the risky signing or risk for the user is not like evaluated immediately, but it will get there after 30 or 40 minutes or one hour, two hours, depends on how micro, how long it will take Microsoft to like process all the signals. More important is it's in risky signing. So for example, attacker will be able to sign in as a user. He will do it from, for example, some malware linked IP address, like it's here or it's deprecated. So for example, and it will be an anonymous token. It should be stopped. The session should be stopped immediately, but it won't because no one knows that it's a risky signing. But after 20 minutes, the signal will be processed and the signing will be marked as a risky signing. And in that case, when the, uh, when the attacker will come to refresh his access token, he will be blocked. So he, it doesn't stop, like the offline detections doesn't stop him from accessing the resources immediately. He will be able to access it, but after a brief period of time, like one hour, he will be stopped. So, okay. Better than nothing, but the good part as well is you will receive the information that there has been such a risk and you can act on it. So those are risk users and risky signings. It's nice to like, it's there already. It's good to work with it because it's a low noise signal. It's much better than to be going through signing logs on yourself. And with risky signings, there are the, this is what Microsoft is uh, monitoring. And in case you don't have P2, you will see everything as an additional risk detected or maybe the other non-premium stuff. Yeah. So, and the last part is like defender alerts. Because look, these three parts or three, three signals, they are there. They don't require much more effort from you, but they are quite precise and they are not noisy at all. So if you, if to start somewhere, I would start here. And the difference between the risk user and risk signing means like user is an entity and every time he signs in, there is a signing, you know, so, oh, why can be like, why, why it's different? Oh, because now, for example, as a user, you are working, uh, you are signing it on your private computer or enterprise computer and mobile. So you have like five, six sessions open. They are legit. And then 
comes attacker and he signs in as you. And this sign in will be marked as like risky, risk one, and it can be blocked. But it won't block the other user signs, sign ins. Or maybe the attacker will sign, uh, steal some tokens and these tokens will be blocked, but the user can work or continue his work further. But once uh, there is a risk for the user, it means like, hey, it's strange. So it's maybe not just the sign in, but the user is in risk. So the risk is assigned to user. And then there are other logs. There are added logs, sign in logs, unified access logs. The unified access logs we were like turning on in the demonstration because they are not enabled by default, at least it wasn't for some time. Now maybe for the new tenants it is, I'm not sure. Each log has dif contains different uh, information, has different retention policy. And uh, with the unified audit, audit unified access log, there is 90 days. Microsoft, since he had the incident with the uh, signing tokens leak, he said he will expand, expand it for half, half a year for free. But I haven't seen it in the combination. So I don't know if it's like, if it's true or if it's not, or if he's going to do it. And those three logs you should be like monitoring and having, and maybe 30 days is not enough because you can like figure out that there has been a breach after months and without the logs, you won't be able to see what has been accessed. Uh, if no other account has been accessed. So if you want more attention, you need to use some third party tool, which will like fetch the data and store it, or you can use log analytics or Sentinel in Azure, but those are paid functions. So you have to like choose your solution and do it. And I have a demonstration here with the sign-in logs because it's something I wanted to play with because it's important all the time you will be going to sign-in logs. So what we are going to do, we will like, we are going to make some signals or some events, and then we are going to look into the sign-in logs to see how it looks like. So right now we are going to sign in as a user while using push MFA. And we are signing to office portal. So we did password and push MFA. And now if we will switch to the admin computer and go through the sign-in sign in logs, we will be looking for the logs. Okay, so it's a demo tenant, so it's not loud. If you would be looking uh, to the sign-in logs on like a production environment, it will, it will be uh, like mess of logs. So you see that we found the logs. There is a small screenshot from the time from the source computer when we were doing the action. So we see there are two logs. Uh, I will use filter, which is something you will be using once you are doing it on a production environment. And in total, there are four logs, oh, signing logs. So we can click on it. Uh, the first log is Office Home application and the, the others are like some shared applications which are used all of, every time when you are using these web interfaces. It's not so important, of course, on them. I, I will be focusing more on the target application. So there are some information like uh, how, like if it was successful, if it was MFA, uh, who was the user, who was the, what was the application, some correlation IDs. And then what's important for us is, for example, application details which tells us how was the user authenticated. And we see that he was authenticated by using password and mobile app notification as an MFA. And then we can see what condition access were applied. As we were speaking about condition access policies, you can see that there are all the condition access policies which we have created. And we see which condition access policies were applied. And we can see what are the grant controls or session controls which are going to be applied on this session directly and if we we can switch to the user sign-ins non-interactive 
to see if there has been some other signings which are not interactive and you can see like there, there's been plenty of them. So I tell you, like going through signing logs is not easy. And what we are mostly focusing is the user signings interactive. It means like that the user did the signing and he did it like he came to the application for the, like he came to the application. The sign-in logs non-interactive means like the application came on behalf of the user to the enter ID and ask for other tokens. So right now we will try to open different application through portal 365 and we will open Outdo. It's a different application, it's a different URL. And we will do refresh on sign-in logs to see if there are some new sign-in logs. And yes, there are, we can see it. And again, there are, there is an application Office 365 Exchange Online. And if we open it, we have similar information like last time, but there will be some changes. If we will go to the application details, we will see that the single factor or first factor and the second factor were certified previously. And we don't know what, if it was the password or something else and how was the MFA done. Uh, that's something I don't see very handy because for me, for as an admin, I would like to know that. And it was previously satisfied. I would like to know how to find out the first log, which was the interactive signing of the user. But I don't know how to do that. I believe it's not possible. Maybe in the future, Microsoft will extend the functionality and it will be there. But if we will go to the conditional access, policy, we will see how the conditional access policies were applied. So that's the same, it's working. Okay. So the other thing to try is in the last episodes, we were using the 365 stealer and the stealer did, did the, did the illicit application consent grant. So the user approved this application of the attacker to access the enter ID on behalf of the user. And as we demonstrated, we have there some access and the refresh token. We see that the, the tokens are two, two days old. So the access token is not valid anymore, but the refresh token is valid for 30, 30 days. So what we will do is that we will refresh the tokens. We will do, we will use the refresh token to have new access token and new refresh token. So I did it. And now we can like refresh the page and we see that we have new tokens. And the question is, do we will see it in sign in logs because the application signed in as a user? And answer is yes, we will see it. Uh, we did it as a different user. It was Lydia. So like clean the filter refresh it, but we don't see any Lydia access. But if we will go to the non-interactive, as well, we can do a new filter. And now, if we will go to non-interactive, there will be, after refresh, there will be just one sign-in. And we see that it was the application in 365 to which was the application registered by the attacker and the date matches. So if we will click on it, there are again some information and what's interesting for us will be the uh, authentication method and control access. And in authentication details, there is like previously satisfied MFA, but we don't see the first uh, first factor at all. So it's the same problem like last time. And with conditional access, we can see that the conditional access they were applied, the new ones. Because actually, when I was doing the uh, trick before, or like stealing from user, or the, or doing the phishing against user, there were no conditional access policies. So, so the observation is like. When refresh token, actually conditional access are evaluated every time when you are going to ask for an access token. So every time you ask for an access token, conditional access are evaluated. And in this case, and they are evaluated against the actual 
actual state of conditional access policy. So you can sign in to that application, then you add new policies, remove some policies, and when the application will come for a new access token, it will be evaluated against the actual state of conditional access policies, not the state when you did the first login. Okay, let's let's continue. This application had something specific. It had application privileges, not just the delegated ones. So the application has identity and enter ID, and it can sign in on itself. So we are using PowerShell to sign in as that application, and we will have enter ID users listed. Just the action is not important. We just want to know how will look like the signing of the application to the enter ID. So this time we have to look in different place. We have to look in service principle signings and we will find out that the application signed in. But why it's service principle signing? Because the application didn't use any user identity or access on behalf of, but it used its service principle, its secret to log in into and try it. And if we will like open it, the log, the sign in log, there is there's again some basic information and then in application details we don't see any application details so we don't even see i guess if we sign it as uh, with secret or certificate and if there are multiple secrets i don't know if we are able to dis distinguish which secret was used and another important thing is that if we will go to conditional access we see there are no conditional access policies applied. That's because they don't apply to service principles. It's important to know about it and important to realize that if you have a developer and he's developing some application with strong application privileges, he has to be very secure about the secrets because once they leak, the attackers, they can access the data from all around the world because the conditional access policies are not going to stop it. So right now, let's sign in into the enterprise device with Windows Hello for Business and open the browser. You will see the user will be signing because there will be PRT token. He's signing into a portal. So let's go back to the sign logs. This time it's interactive logon and we can see that the Lydia has been locked to several applications. So it's the Office Home application, which we know from before, that's the portal of Office. And then the, the first one is Windows Sign-in. And then that's, that's nice because we can see that, uh, we can see that we are having logs when the user signs into his computer. Interesting is to see that application requirement was single factor application because all the time when you are signing to your computer, it's a single factor. You could have multiple factor. I believe I haven't been trying it in the lab. If you use a new functionality, which is like use Azure AD to sign into your computer. And then there is a return that single factor, but MFA required because it was in the token. And that was because, uh, and Windows L4 business was used and it's like MFA or it's multi factor application, uh, considered. And we see that uh, there is PRT token as well. It was the PR token with the Windows Hello for Business. And in application details, we will see Windows Hello for Business was used to sign a user. And in conditional access, there are no conditional access policies because to sign into your computer, no conditional access policies are uh, applied. Again, exception would be if you would configure your windows to do Azure AD signing. In that case, conditional access would be in place, I believe. And if we will go to the office home, we see that even if we sign in with Windows Hello for Business, which was like done with single factor, which was the pin, still the tokens which we have and how we are accessing other um, applications are MFA. In application details, we see that 
like the first and second factor they were previously satisfied, but we don't know how. And condition access were applied. So even if the condition access policies they don't apply to sign into your computer, doesn't mean that once you are start once you start to access Azure AD resources or applications, that the condition access policies won't be applied. And maybe what can you think about is that what happens? Oh yeah. Then there is other functionality which we have that uh, we can sign in or. If we have the privileges, we can access other computers from this computer. So, for example, we are accessing administrative uh, shares on other computer, and we can as well use PSExec to access the shell of the other computer. And the question is like, will we be able to see it in a signing logs that someone was doing this kind of lateral movement in the network? Okay, now we see that we have PSExec to the target computer and if we will go to the sign in logs and do a refresh we see that we want these informations are not locked in sign in logs so the next is like what happens if computer is without the network and we sign in with windows all for business are we going to receive the windows sign in even to sign in logs of course we cannot sign we cannot receive it uh, in real time, but maybe once the computer is on the network, he will upload the logs uh, additionally. But I haven't been able to... No. From what I was trying to, I just connected the computer on the network and waited half an hour, but still I couldn't see the Windows sign in. So it's good and bad. It's good that we can have some information about users signing into the windows but bad is that it's not full so we are missing some events so we cannot rely on that because if the, it's there then we know that it happens but if there is no window if there is if there isn't window sign-in lock it can mean like the sign-in was done during the offline period or it didn't happen but we don't know what which of these two situations occurred. And then we have audit logs. Uh, these audit logs, they show the changes in the entry ID configuration. So for example, if we were doing the persistence with CA, it would cause these two audit, uh, twist, these two events. And then we have to be here, like looking for the events and we need to know which events we are looking for. So what to search for in logs, uh, like those are some examples, but it doesn't mean it's, it's a, it's a complete list, you know, so you are going to look for the changes in privileged groups, roles, uh, use of break glass admin, GDEP, DEP, consent to application, application permissions, application secret changes, use of temporary access passwords, change in trusted CAs, tenant sync, main flow, or you can be hunting for something new. So like it's more about the imaginary and time possibilities of each of us. And then there is auditing. You know, audit means like <sighs> with monitoring, we are looking on the actual changes, but it can happen that some changes passes our eyes or we don't like or act on it. So once a year, or once every second year, we can do some audit. So go through the actual configuration, or maybe even we are onboarding a new customer, we can go through his configuration to put it in line or to make it compliant with our baseline. So for that, uh, it's nice to use some existing tools. There are three of them. Uh, the functionality is not very complex so far, but yeah, we have to think uh, about the thing that entry ID security is a very young and developing topic. And we need more people doing the research and more people speaking on conferences. For example, my last observation was when I was looking on my own account, you can see what are my application methods. I know of them, all of them, but with Windows Hello for Business, you can see that one Windows Hello for Business doesn't specify any detail what's the name of the computer. 
if I would like double click on it and see the object ID and search it out in Enter ID, I would find out that it's one of my lab computers. But the other comp, but it's like not, it's not making our life easy if the, it's not displayed on the like first page. And then there's a Windows Hello for Business for my uh, laptop, which is not Enter ID join, it's Enter ID registered only. And I thought that only joint devices or hybrid devices can have Windows Hello for Business. But now I see that even registered devices have Windows Hello for Business. And that's a question to, for the future if we shouldn't disable users' possibility to register devices to Enter ID because it can be a headache because Windows Hello for Business is an application method. It's not just a PRT token, it's even stronger than PRT token because it can create new PRT tokens. And then it's about as the users were able to register and enjoy whatever computer or device to the Enter ID, <laughs> like the Enter ID environments are a complete mess right now. And that's the same with applications. Like on the left side, there's a demo tenant with 100 or less than 200 applications. And on the other side, there are more than 800 applications on existing tenant, which is like four or five years old. And yeah, that's a mess which needs to be cleaned up and it won't be so easy to clean it up. Then I have some screenshot from the auditing tool. So this is a scuba. Uh, which is from CISA agency and yeah, that's, that's great. They have some like minimum baseline and I would start with them or Pincastle, which is doing a great job on auditing on-premise active directories. And now it supports, uh, Azure ADs as well. Okay. The last thing is, uh, backup of Microsoft 365. We backup our tenants. We use a uh, Veeam backup for that. Uh, we are happy with that. The question is like, do we need to back it up or we don't? It depends, you know, from my point of view, like Microsoft is not responsible for backup of the data of VR. It can happen that the users, they delete something. In that case, there is a trash bin, but if as we as elements, we delete some mailbox and after some time we realize that we shouldn't delete it or someone needs to find out more uh, data from that or user delete something and figures it out after the trash bin is already emptied. Then we can go to the backups because the backups, they have some longer retention policy. Or if something would happen to Microsoft and they would lose the data, then you we would have to like go to the backups as well. Or maybe something goes real bad and uh, we will have to like restore to some offline environment. We can do it with, uh, the backups. Depends on everyone's mind. Okay. So now we know what we want to monitor, what we want to configure, but the, the way how to do it for us, like an MSP, MMS, MSSP company. The biggest challenge is the multi-tenancy that we need to do it over all of our customer base that we want all of our customers are in compliant with the baseline and to monitor it that, for example, Microsoft has some tools, but they are not multi-tenant or the native reports in Android are not multi-tenant, but we don't have time to switch to every tenant and check the reports, which other tenant check the reports. We need some tool which will be mm, multi-tenant support um, enabled and we will be able to look just to one place. Okay, so there are some possibilities like Microsoft Lighthouse, which we have access, Neighbor, which is our existing partner, or Admin Android, which I like. It looks like we could solve a lot of things with it. And as well, we will use custom scripts, uh, which will be like going through every tenant and checking the configuration and doing the monitoring. Like with custom scripts, we will do the same stuff uh, like with the third party tool, but for things the third party tool doesn't support. And then for auditing, I would stick with the tools I have been, I've been demonstrating or showing. And then what kind of license I would recommend. Like for small companies, up to 300 people, 
I think that the business premium is a great match because it has like desktop office apps, it has all the 365 functionality, Exchange SharePoint OneDrive, it has Teams, but I don't know if Teams won't be separated uh, due to the European Union. It has Entry P1, it has Intune, it has Defender Business, which is like, which includes EDR solution and it has Azure information prediction. Like for that money, it feels reasonable. And I think it's like <clears throat> the best license for a company which, which want to be cloud native, which don't have on-prem Active Directory because then he needs Intune to manage the computers, definitely needs P1 for Entry ID and it can use Defender uh, like an EDR solution. Uh, okay, uh, and the last thing uh, is like what to do in case of account compromise, you know, so the first thing would be to block signing of the user. Then I would revoke his sessions. I would uh, validate or inspect his authentication methods, reset his password, go through the logs to see if the same IP address wasn't signed into different users, uh, what kind of data the attacker accessed or what kind of configuration changes he did. And then I would enable the sign-in logs again, maybe to go through the device computer or user devices as well. Yeah, but you know that Entry is evolving rapidly, so it's never ending story, I believe. Like once we reach this like basic hardening, it's about flow or flowing and continue with other hardening and monitoring to monitor more, harder more. Uh, observe what's going on in the wild, like what are the attackers right now doing, what are the trends, and alter the defense for that, or prepare the defense for that. Then to use Defender for cloud, uh, cloud apps, uh, Defender for Office 365, Defender for identity, and as well utilize Intune because Intune has a lot of possibilities, so it would be another series of uh, lectures, and then Azure resources like virtual machines, storage as a service, uh, database as a service, uh, networks, artificial intelligence, and so on. Oh, that's a, another topic, and it's a huge one. And it so all the time it requires to learn something new. And as a summary, so the security or defense of Entry ID consists of auditing, hardening, monitoring, and backup of the data. The important is to keep it simple because complexity is an enemy of security and don't stop learning because our our subject IT is still evolving so rapidly. Then you will find out some great resources of other great guys and, and research of them. I, If you are into this topic, I recommend to go through it. and. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed today's session. I hope you find out or you learn some new information and I will be looking forward to see you soon.